Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and uh, welcome to the webinar for innovation productivity and digital area in uh, beyond the Asia. So my name is Yi Huang, I'm from Fudan University. Today, we are very glad to have a, you know, two very distinguished speakers today, and uh, from our speaker, uh, Professor Huang Tan, and uh, she's going to present her joint, uh, joint work uh, with the BM board from UBC and uh, uh, Susan Ma from uh, LC as well. And currently, Professor Huang Tan is an assistant professor of finance at LC. Before that, she was a P she got her PhD from HEC Paris, and she got uh, all her amazing publication, I uh, review review finance studies, GFE, focus on banking, fintech, and hospital finance. And we also have a now very distinguished discussion. Uh, also, Huang is now an alumni from Fudan University, by the way. And also, we have a distinguished discussion. And Professor uh, Jingjie Jing, and uh, uh, Jingjie was the uh, a professor of uh, economics at Maryland, University of Maryland. Uh, also, she was uh, serving for she's expertise. Uh, she's a global leading scholar in terms of digital economy and I/O and uh, you know fintech. And previously, she was also working for the director of a bureau of Econ economics at the FTC, Fed uh, Trade Commission. And also, she's uh, she's uh, she's served all the you know uh, leading leading journal as an editor and an associate editor. And now let's start with uh, the presentation by Professor Huang Tan for 25 minutes. Afterwards, we're going to leave the amazing discussion to Professor Jingjie and uh, for another 25 minutes. In the end, we're going to have our you know, floor discussion. And Professor Huang Tan, it's your floor. floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, please interrupt me whenever you have questions during my presentation. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And I was just about to mention this is joint work with Bo Bian, who is also in the audience, and Xin Shen Ma, uh, LSE PhD student. Um, so you may have heard of the phrase, data is the new oil. 15 years ago, if we look at the world's largest companies ranked by market uh, capitalization, the largest companies are industry companies, including the top two firms, which are oil companies, ExxonMobil and PetroChina. Well, if you look at the ranking today, five out of the top six companies are data-driven companies, including Microsoft, Apple, uh, Amazon, Alphabet, and Facebook. So the analogy between data and oil does bear some merit in highlighting the value of data for firms in the digital era. For a very long time, firms have been amassing data for millions of users without much discipline. Um, the cost to record, store, disseminate, and analyze data is essentially free, but perhaps not anymore. Um, this has to do with the growing public concerns about data privacy, which is partly in association with a surge in the number of data breach incidents we have been observing. And in turn, it triggered a wave of data privacy regulations around the world, including EU's GDPR, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act, and China's PIDL. Last year, SEC also stepped up the requirement by making uh, cybersecurity disclosure mandatory for public firms in the US. However, despite the importance of data for firms and privacy concern as a potentially very substantial constraining factor, we know surprisingly little about the market for data privacy. Regarding the supply side, due to data limitations, it is quite challenging to measure firms' data collection activities in a systematic way. Hence, we really do not have a good answer to the question of what data are being collected and for what purposes. Regarding the demand side, there is still ongoing debate about whether there is a demand for privacy or not. And this is related to the so-called privacy paradox. That is, everyone says they're concerned about data privacy, but in reality, they easily relinquish access to personal data in online activities. Uh, hence, having a better understanding of the demand for privacy will also help us assess the impact uh, of these privacy concerns on firm valuations in the digital economy. So how are we gonna investigate these questions? We're gonna do so in a nicely defined empirical context that is the mobile app market. Two features of this market motivate our focus on it. First of all, mobile apps have become increasingly important for not only consumers, but also firms. In 2020, smartphones account for 70% of the total digital media time, which fueled a over 100 uh, billion a year industry based on app revenue and mobile advertising. 
The second feature of this market has to do with Apple's privacy label policy. On December 14th of 2020, Apple implemented this policy requiring all app developers to disclose their data collection practices in a visible and easily digestible manner, as shown in the following phone screen. And of course, I will tell you much more about these privacy labels later on. But these labels are really meant to resemble the food nutrition label, and it offers an at-glance summary of the firm's data collection activities. Exploiting Apple's privacy labels, we on the supply side scrape these labels of the most popular apps, not only in the US, but uh, in more than 90 countries. Because the reporting format is consistent across countries and apps, uh, the cross-sectional comparison is going to be informative. And very crucially, the information contained in the privacy labels also allow us to infer the intrusiveness of the data use. On the demand side, we try to investigate how consumers' demand for digital service uh, react to the release of privacy labels. And we gauge uh, the demand for digital services, in particular apps, using app-level download and revenue data we purchase from our data vendor. We provide causal evidence on the impact of the privacy label using the Android version uh, of the same app as a natural control group. We also conduct event study in which we look at stock market reactions and firms' earnings uh, around the policies implementation. So here's a preview of our main findings. On the supply side, based on the privacy labels, we document that 80% of the data items collected are for purposes unrelated to app functionality. So they're really not essential for the app to function well. What are these other purposes? One of which is third party advertising and marketing. And in terms of the apps that collect the most data for that purpose, we find it is uh, mostly games, news, shopping, and entertainment apps. We also find a lot of cross-sectional heterogeneities, particularly the top data collectors tend to be the apps uh, developed by public firms, apps with larger market shares and better ratings. On the demand side, as mentioned before, we are looking at how consumers react to the disclosure of firms' data collection practices, and we find that Relative to the Android counterpart, the iOS version on average experienced a 14 to 15% drop in the weekly download and revenue, which is a persistent effect. And that reaction is also more negative for more privacy invasive apps and for apps that can, uh, that can be easily substitutable. Uh, we also document cross-country heterogeneity in consumers' reaction and try to explain this cross-country heterogeneity using country-level factors, including the enforcement status of the data privacy laws, consumers' general attitude towards privacy and trust in major companies. Um, so if we believe this negative effect in the uh, product market is persistent, we should also see it to translate into a diverse stock market reaction, which is indeed what we find following the privacy labels policy uh, uh, over a six month period, we document a minus five to minus 10% cumulative abnormal returns for the public firms with an app in our sample. And that negative stock market reaction is also driven by firms that harvest more data. And we find corrobor uh, corroborating evidence of a decline in those firms earnings as well. So I think now it's a good time for me to uh, um, dig deeper into our uh, empirical setting and how we construct the measures of firm's data collection intensity. To show you how the privacy labels look like, we took a screenshot of Facebook's um, download page uh, within the Apple's App Store. And this is based on the PC version, so the phone size is not really uh, mobile user friendly. Um, but in the middle, you have the review and rating section, and Facebook obviously doesn't have stellar uh, rating at all. And right below it, you have the newly added app privacy section. Uh, already from this screenshot, you can see there are two gray blocks, which represent major data categories as defined by Apple. There are, um, there are three major data categories in total. There are data used to track you, data linked to you, and data not linked to you depending on whether the data is shared or whether the data is not shared but linked to your true identity or it's not even linked to your true identity, the data item can fall under one or multiple categories. 
Now, zooming into this app privacy section, you can see much richer information. For, exa for example, within data linked to you, Facebook collects tons of uh, data types, including health and fitness data, financial info, contact info, user content, which can even include your private messages with friends within Facebook. So if you click on any region uh, in this section or the see details button at the upper right corner, an expanded window will show up, which provides two additional types of information. The first additional type of information is called data item as, uh, as highlighted in yellow. So within each data type that you saw on the previous screen, for example, contact information, you can even have more granularly defined data item. Um, here, Facebook collects your physical address, email address, name and phone number under contact information. The second additional type of information is called data use or data collection purpose, and that's highlighted in green. Here we are showing a list of data items and data types that Facebook collect precisely for that purpose, third-party advertising. And this is what, uh, only one of the six officially defined data uses. So because of the consistent reporting format across app developers, we can actually summarize the information contained in those privacy labels in a pretty clear uh, structure. Uh, starting from the beginning, we have the previously mentioned three major data categories, data used to track you, link to you, and not link to you. Under data linked to you and not data not linked to you, you can observe uh, the specific data use and there are six of them in total, so it's useful to go through the list at, uh, at least once during the presentation. These six data uses are ad functionality, third-party advertising, developers advertising and marketing, product personalization, analytics, and other purposes. Within each data use, you can have 14 data types and 34 data items. So notice that for the data used to track users, the data use is not available because by default, any data items collected to track users across networks or firms are for third-party advertising. So there's no need to specify the data use. All right, so based on this very clear structure uh, of privacy labels. Excuse me, may, 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 I, may I ask a question? Um, uh, first, honestly, until I see this, I didn't know that um, they collect so much data. So, uh, the real question is comparing, I mean, both both the East and West collect this kind of data. Do you have any idea how this compared to the data collected in China? Yes, we do uh, have cross-country uh, comparisons in terms of the data collection intensity. I did not include the graph in the presentation for the sake of time, but we do document that pattern in the uh, paper. In particular, we find that Asian apps compared to the US, Canada, Canadian, or uh, European apps tend to collect fewer data items, which is perhaps because the data market is not as advanced uh, in Asia as in the US. So actually, um, if there's anything about evasion of privacy, is worse over in the on the, in the West. Um, so um, we're just documenting the patterns uh, as um, revealed by the privacy labels. And um, I have to uh, caution that we don't have China in our sample because for oh, the identification purpose, we do have uh, we do need uh, the app to be listed in the um, Google Play to be included in our sample. And for that reason, we don't have China. But if you look at where I mentioned Asian countries, what I have in mind is really Japan or Korea. If you compare these two countries to US, they tend to collect fewer data items. Thank you. So based on this clear structure of privacy labels, we come up with three very straightforward measures of data collection intensity at the app level. The first one is the indicator variable that takes value one if the app uh, collects data used to track users and shares that data with a third party. Uh, the next two variables are uh, really continuous variables. They are the number of data types and the number of data items collected. So that is our main measures. What, are, what about our main empirical sample? For your information, there are over 6 million apps across the two platforms, and we cannot possibly scrape the information for all these 6 million apps. 
So we chose to focus on the top 10,000 apps based on their annual download across the two platforms in 2020. But it turns out this small fraction of um, top 10,000 apps generated uh, over 80% of the storewide download and over 90% of the storewide revenue. So we do view our sample as uh, quite relevant and representative. Based on this top 10,000 app sample, we document that over 60% of apps collect data used to track users. The average app in our sample collects 14 data types and 22 data items. The bottom part of this table breaks down the total number of data items collected uh, by the six data used. And focusing on the last row, you see that only four out of the 22 data items collected are for app functionality. So the remaining 18 out of 22 or the remaining 80% are not essential for the app to function well. Um, my next set of slides are going to be about cross-sectional heterogeneities. Um, the first dimension we look at is actually app ranking. Here you're looking at a heat map where darker colors means higher data collection intensity, and we sort apps into this two-dimensional space where the horizontal axis represent app ranking and the y-axis represent app categories. So two observations emerge from the heat map. First of all, highly ranked apps tend to collect more data from users. That's why you have darker colors towards the left hand side of the heat map. And second, there is substantial within category variation. So even if you zoom into a random app category, different apps still differ a lot in their app uh, collection activities. And we are going to exploit that heterogeneity later on in our uh, definitive analysis. The next dimension we look at is the data use, which is really uh, the novelty of our measure, and this hasn't been documented uh, in any prior work. So this is sort of the uh, ranking uh, along which we uh, think the uh, privacy intrus uh, the intrusiveness of the data use comes in. So we think the third party advertising is the most problematic one and app functionality is the least problematic, uh, problematic one. That's why I assign uh, the green color to app functionality. If we don't look at the breakdown of the data use, just focus on the total data number of data uh, types collected, shopping apps really lead the ranking by a huge margin. Well, if you focus on the most problematic one, third-party advertising, the ranking shuffles quite a bit, with game apps uh, lead the ranking, followed by entertainment, news, and shoppings. And one explanation for this pattern is customer data um, generated in these um, activities, in these service categories, are really easy to monetize, and they are valuable for other apps. So that's why these apps tend to collect a lot of data. Um, the last pattern I want to emphasize uh, on the supply side is about the time series variation in firm's data collection activities. Here, because we're scraping the privacy labels at a monthly frequency, we can really track how each app is doing in terms of data collection over time. And during a 12 month observation window, we really, really observe very little time series changes at the app level. For example, here we are looking at the monthly fraction of apps that turned on or turn off their tracking behaviors uh, at a monthly frequency, and only up to 0.34% of apps ever change that behavior. Uh, if you count the total number of data items at the app level, you find very similar pattern, only up to 0.6% of apps ever increased or decreased this uh, total number of data items on a monthly basis. So this pattern suggests the data collection activities is really not something the firm could adjust on a daily basis. Rather, it is deeply underlying the firm's business model and monetization model, so it's quite costly to adjust. All right, so in the remaining time, let me focus on the demand side, namely how consumers react to the release of privacy labels. So here you're looking at a calendar which shows the uh, daily number of apps releasing their privacy labels. And the implementation date was December 14th of 2020. So many apps actually released their privacy labels in the few weeks after the policy's official implementation. 
but there still remains uh, quite sizable variation in terms of the timing of apps privacy label release. That is because Apple only required app developers to release this information no later than their next version update, and different apps may have different schedules in terms of version updates. So this timing, these variations in timing really allows us to control for some aggregate shocks or one-off shocks to either digital consumption related to COVID restriction, for example, or other uh, one-off regulation that affects the supply of privacy, such as CCPA, which was implemented in the same year. And on top of that, we bring in this additional control group, which is the Android version of the very same app. So our uh, diff in diff identification strategy uh, really um, becomes quite straightforward. We're comparing the iOS app to the Android app and the pre-post is defined differentially for different apps. So when you do diff in diff, the underlying assumption is there's parallel trend in outcome variable prior to the shock. Here we are plotting the total weekly downloads and total weekly revenue separately for our uh, treated and control group just to visually validate the parallel trend assumption. On the left hand side, we have the weekly download. On the right hand side, weekly revenue. So notice. Uh, sorry, Juan. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Just, just a quick. Yeah. Somehow I missed it. Why is iOS the treatment group and the Android is the control group? So um, that is because this policy was only implemented by Apple and oh, okay. Apple enforcement power on the iOS version, not the Android version. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, thanks. So here, the solid line represents uh, iOS and the dashed line Android. Across both measures of demand, we have a parallel trend. And um, I would like to also use the opportunity to highlight the difference between download and revenue. Notice there's a huge spike in April of 2020, and this uh, huge spike was caused by the lockdown restriction uh, put in place end of March uh, in the US. And this sudden influx of new users translated into a permanent increase in the revenue for the um, apps. So um, this suggests the download really reflect usage of the app by new users, and it's a flow variable, while the revenue reflect the usage of the app uh, by both existing and new users. So it's more like a stock variable, and we're going to use a combination of um, revenue and download to really capture the demand for apps. All right, so before showing you any regression tables, I want to show you that the treatment effect is already visible in the raw data. The y-axis shows the share of iOS download divided by total download across the two platforms. And the y, uh, vertical line shows uh, the time uh, when each app releases their own privacy labels. Before the privacy label release, there was not so much reaction. And immediately after, you see a huge drop in the share of download coming from the iOS platform, which suggests um, even in a regression setting, uh, you should be able to find negative and significant effect. So quantifying that treatment effect uh, with a diff in diff specification, depending on what sample you are using, we may have a uh, um, uh, treatment effect on download ranging from 11% to 14%, and that's a negative effect. And on the revenue side, the treatment effect ranges from 14% to uh, 19%. So if you do believe the treatment effect is driven by privacy concerns, you should expect to see a more negative reaction or a larger impact on download and revenue when the app collects tons of information from users. And this is what we find. Here we're splitting the sample based on one of our data collection intensity measure, which is simply the number of data types uh, being collected by the app. And on the right hand side, you have the high group. On the right hand side, you have the low group, meaning the privacy centric apps. So most of the reaction or treatment effect uh, is concentrated in the privacy invasive uh, group. And I would like to also invite you to um, uh, uh, pay attention to the fact that there is no positive spillover effect to the privacy centric apps in our sample, which suggests even the most privacy-centric apps in our sample, which are at the bottom quartile of the data collection intensity distribution, still collect more data than consumers expected prior to the availability of this information. So it suggests consumers largely underestimate the data collection intensity of apps. Now, 
Um, I have two more tables on uh, using this diff in diff specification. And the first dimension we look at uh, on top of the data collection intensity is data use, because depending on the how the firm is use uh, uh, your data, you may react differently. Here, we're just interacting the double interaction term additionally with this um, uh, the number of data items collected for each of these six data use. And as expected, when the data is collected for other purposes or app functionality, there's no incremental drop in this app's download. While when it's collected for the more problematic data use, including advertising or even product personalization, we do observe an incremental drop. So the last dimension we look at is mar uh, market power of the apps, because uh, consumers, when they choose whether to download the app or not, they really face a trade-off between data privacy and uh, digital services. When they decide to exchange the data or relinquish access to personal data, they're not giving up their data for free. They're exchanging their data for digital services. So one natural um, prediction arises from this conceptual framework, which is when the app is more valuable or more useful for the users, you would expect a more uh, a minor uh, negative reaction. So we measure the app's market power or how easy it is to substitute the app with an outside option using various metrics, including the app's platform-wide ranking data uh, and whether within its own category, the market share is above the 90th, um, 90th uh, percentile and the app's age. So all of these measures presumably capture how valuable uh, the app is. And across the measures, we always find a larger drop when the app is more easily substitute, uh, substitutable, which highlight this trade-off between digital service and data privacy. So we have done tons of robustness checks and uh, placebo treatment effect, and I won't uh, spend much time here. Uh, just um, let you know the results are really robust. All right, so um, in my remaining time about this uh, on the data privacy, on the demand for data privacy part, I'm going to talk about cross-country uh, heterogeneities. Here you are looking at a work map which shows the coverage of our data. We really have data on different continents and uh, countries with different stages of development. Um, we have done this different diff uh, analysis for each of these 90 countries in our sample, and we try to associate this country level average reaction to a wide range of country level factors. The first set of factors we look at is how good or how uh, um, well the legal protection uh, in place uh, was already um, um, there. So. Uh, we find that when the legal protection status is poorer, consumers react more negatively because they don't already feel quite well protected by the regulation. The second set of country level factor we consider is how confident consumers are in the data privacy. And we find that when they're less confident in how well their uh, privacy is protected, they also react more strongly. And the last set of factor we consider is called trust in the private sector. And we find when in general, the public trusts less in primary, uh, in private sectors or in major companies, uh, they react more negatively. So we view this as a nice validation exercise of our uh, privacy uh, demand measure. So uh, switching gear a little bit, we want to talk about the valuation implications of this privacy concern, because as mentioned at the beginning, for a very long time, these tech firms have been collecting data without really paying much. But now, if we do believe that privacy concerns are growing, we should start to consider privacy concerns as a constraining factor of the growth of tech firms in the digital economy. So that's the purpose of this exercise. What we're doing here is simply by looking at the cumulative abnormal returns of the public firms in our sample, namely public firms with an app. And here we are splitting the sample again by the firm's data collection intensity, high versus low. And most of the negative stock market reaction uh, really comes from the data, heavy data collectors. Uh, here, each line of, um, represent the cumulative abnormal return evaluated against different factor model from the Pharma French three factor model and to the uh, Pharma French five factor model. So focusing on, for example, the Pharma French five, uh, five factor model, the cumulative abnormal return following the policies implementation for the heavy data collectors is around 
10%, while for the more greener firms, the more privacy-centric firms, it's only minus 3%. So um, notice also how during uh, the initial period, there's no really sharp negative drop in the cumulative abnormal return. So for about a month or 40 days, there is an inaction period where you don't really see uh, much going on. And we try to also understand why there seem to be investor on the reaction following the policy's initial implementation. We have two explanations for that, which are not mutually exclusive. The first explanation has to do with the privacy paradox that I mentioned at the very beginning, because there's no consensus regarding whether there is a demand for privacy or not, uh, investors, including researchers, um, cannot really predict how consumers re uh, will react. Whether they will react at all remains a largely uh, unanswered question, so that's why we don't see an immediate reaction. The second explanation has to do with investors' inattention because this privacy label is really displayed in a passive way. Many investors may not uh, pay attention to the information contained in the privacy labels, or they may not be even aware of the policy. Hence, uh, we, uh, that may also explain the initial underreaction. So consistent with these two explanations, we also find supporting evidence Corresponding more to the uncertainties about consumers' reaction, we find that when the first post-policy earnings report is released, consumers do wake up because re they realize privacy concerns do matter for firms' earnings, and that's when they start to uh, really react swiftly, and I will show you uh, evidence on that momentarily. The second piece of supporting evidence more consistent with investors in attention um, um, is um, based on the fact that Apple implemented a second initiative uh, five months after the privacy label policy asking app developers to show a notification window if they want to share customer data with a third party. So now if customers or investors are bound with this notification window, they do start to notice this uh, major uh, privacy protection initiative by Apple. So we do show that when the policy uh, becomes more salient, uh, investors react swiftly. All right, so more related to the first explanation, uncertainties about consumers' reaction. First of all, we validate using firms' earnings data that firms' earnings are indeed negatively impacted by the policy. So here we are looking at quarter level data at the firm level. In order to construct a firm's exposure to the policy, we have to aggregate uh, the shock to the firm level. We cannot use the Android versus uh, iOS to define the treaty versus control anymore. So at the firm level, we simply calculate the share of the firm's app that collect data used to track users and share the data with third parties as the exposure to this policy. And we find more exposed firms to be more negatively in, uh, uh, affected. And when it comes to the industries that are most exposed to the uh, policy, which are retail and service firms, uh, their earnings are also mostly affected. Switching to uh, consumers' reaction around the first post-policy earnings release, as you can see, immediately after these companies release their uh, earnings after the policy, uh, consumers start to react because they notice actually there's a negative or um, the earnings does not meet expectation. So they start to uh, ask the question of why, and that may lead them to trace back to the privacy label policy. Related to the second explanation of investors in attention, uh, as mentioned before, we're exploiting the second part of Apple's privacy campaign, which is officially called the app tracking transparency. Here you are looking at a phone screen, uh, again, using Facebook as an example. Now, if Facebook wants to track you or share your data with a third party, they have to show you this consent uh, window and you have to formally give consent for them to track you. So we argue that this notification really makes Apple's privacy protection initiative more salient. And also just based on this mere, this very small window, you can infer that Facebook does use your data to track you and share it with third parties. So following the second part of Apple's privacy campaign, we do show that investors uh, react quite swiftly. So here we have daily data and immediately after the policy, second policy implementation, we see a sharp drop in these firms' cumulative abnormal return. 
All right, so um, I guess my time is uh, actually way over. Uh, let me conclude. Um, I would like to highlight uh, one thing, uh, one implication of our result, which is the lack of consumers' awareness can be one explanation for this um, uh, often uh, uh, discussed privacy paradox. You know, it's not that consumers do not really protect their own privacy, it's because they lack the relevant information to protect their own privacy. But once you make that information digestible and easily available, um, they take, uh, they use their own ways, uh, they chose um, by reveal preference, they chose more privacy-centric apps in order to provide uh, protect their own privacy. And another policy implications of that is uh, transparency and disclosure quality are the key dimensions policymakers should care about. And the last costly way to implement that is maybe through collaboration between uh, regulators and platforms. And um, let me just um, uh, mention one more thing, which is uh, Google actually also followed up um, uh, Apple's privacy campaign by implementing not only the Google version of privacy labels, but also by announcing uh, its plans to phase out third-party cookies um, placed in any website if you use uh, Chrome starting in 2023. So uh, the tightening of the data privacy regulations is here to stay. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Juan. Let's uh, welcome Professor Jingjie as now discussion to share her insight. Thank you. And another 25 minutes. Um, thank you, E, for um inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. I really enjoy reading it. As Juan has um, touched on, this is a really important policy area. I think if you look at survey results, consumers are overwhelmingly concerned about um, privacy um, issues. Um, for example, in the US, the survey shows that 90 plus percent of people are really concerned about privacy, but they also feel helpless that they don't know what to do mm -hmm. about them. So I think the um, Apple's privacy label approach is one of the industry efforts to address this problem. So um, I'm really glad Juan and her co-authors are working on this topic. So let me summarize the findings first. Um, Apple introduced this privacy label policy in December 2020 um, because this only applies to apps on Apple's iOS store, but not on the Android version. Um, this gives a natural DID framework. The apps mm -hmm. on Apple store is a treaty group. The apps on Android store is a control group and they use the same app, but two versions. So that's a very good control and treatment comparison. Furthermore, different apps actually choose to publish privacy labels at different times. So that give a um, very clean identification of staggered treatment. The sample, um, they have two samples. One is the top 10,000 apps in the US and the other is top 10,000 apps um, in other nine non-US countries. The data period um, is about 20 months before, covering both before and after this policy change. So the main findings is that um, we observe most of the sampled apps publish privacy labels on Apple Store by the end of the study period. If we look at the apps that disclose privacy labels, they find the disclosure lead to about 14% drop in weekly app downloads and about 15% drop in weekly app revenue. So these are pretty significant and also economically significant um, changes in, um, in downloads and revenue. And they even find bigger negative impact if the app collects more data or if the data collected are more intrusive for user privacy. And some negative effects are stronger in some countries, such as US, UK, and France than in other countries. And I think it's really nice that they also look at stock market response. Um, they find stock market respond negatively to publicly traded app developers after release um, privacy labels on Apple. So overall, I think they find very clean empirical results in terms of consumer response to the release of privacy labels on Apple's iOS stores as compared to Google's Android version. 
So um, to evaluate the results, I would like to remind everybody about the timing of events. Um, so Juan, correct me if I got this wrong. Um, the data starts from January of 2020. In the middle of 2020, Apple announced privacy labels as a future policy. And then three months later, Apple released a new operation system, iOS 14. And then in December 2020, Apple requires any app update have to disclose privacy labels if they want the update to be um, available on this new operation system. This also implies that if the app is not updated for this new operation system, then this mandatory requirement does not apply. So after that, um, about four to five months, Apple announced another change. And this is the app tracking transparency change for iOS 14.5. Um, this, as Juan mentioned, this actually is a different change. Um, it's actually Apple push a um, kind of pop-up notice when a consumer try to download an app or try to use the app. And that's different from privacy label because privacy label typically is um, provided after the ratings page and the reviews page. So the user have to look for privacy label information rather than receiving a prompt from Apple in their face, basically. And so I want to emphasize these two changes are um, different. Although they are both about user privacy, I believe the ATT prompt just ask user whether you want your data to be tracked or not. It actually does not give user information of whether this particular app tracks what kind of information on you. So, so I think the two are probably complements to each other. The privacy label gives more information about exactly what type of information will be tracked, what information is linked to you, what information is not linked to you. But the ATT is more on um, just getting your consent of being tracked or not. Okay. And then in, um, in May 2021, soon after Apple's announcement of ATT, Google has announced a plan to try to follow up with similar um, logic. So um, the data period of their analysis covered this whole span, okay, which means it covers not only the release of privacy labels, but also the ATT um, prompt change. So I think this is a um, probably important issue for, um, for the paper to address, given that we have two policies going on here, and they are both about user privacy, but somewhat different. Um, there's a question of whether you're capturing the effect of both or you're capturing the effect of one while controlling for the other um, and exactly how good that control is and how we interpret the results and so forth. So that's kind of my first question. The second feature I want to mention is that because these changes were brought by Apple, they actually do not apply to Apple-owned apps. So um, <laughs> if a third-party app is competing with Apple-owned app on the same platform, and this could drive an edge, and it's sort of implicitly, okay? From user's experience, they may see this prompt um, from Apple if the app is a from third-party developer, but do not see um, this prompt, the ATT prompt from a Apple-owned apps. I think this may generate some dynamics um, between the competition of Apple-owned apps and third-party apps. Okay, um, I should also mention that when I read the media report, it seems like the ATT prompt is not only just putting a prompt pop-up in front of a user, it also adds some difficulty in ad attribution um, because the prompt will show up on the, um, the app the receiving app side is also on the publisher app side. So consumers may receive this twice. And um, if if people tends to um, deny the tracking um, in one of them or both of them, then the advertising would not go through and therefore they um, 
the advertisers um, would not be able to um, advertise and the publisher would not be able to receive advertising revenue. So, so that could hurt the financial performance of the app. So that's my, uh, my first comment. My second comment is um, I appreciate the identification use staggered treatment, which depends on the timing of when each app released the privacy label. Strictly speaking, privacy label disclosure is actually voluntary because it's only required when you update the app under the new operation system, which means the app actually need not to give information on privacy label if they do not update, okay? And in theory, even the ATT adoption is voluntary because if the app choose the default of no tracking, then this prompt would not be shown to to users. So given this, I think an obvious question is, why do we observe some apps adopt privacy labels earlier than others? And will there be any selection here? Um, like, for example, would some apps choose to delay in version updating so that they can avoid privacy label disclosure, or at least push it down, um, down the road and do it later? Um, I would imagine for some apps, especially those who have data intensive collection or intrusive data collection may want to watch out sort of just exactly how consumers respond to this and therefore choose a timing that's best for them. So um, I, I don't know whether the data would have something to say about that. Uh, another strategy could be that uh, we know Android actually account for about um, definitely more than half of the market share, um, especially in the international market. So the app developer could try to switch or pivot towards Android users and sort of give up a little bit on the Apple users. So that could also um, motivate them not to um, provide privacy labels or um, or, or doing, it, doing it in a more strategic way. So that's my second comment. I think this, to some extent, may be important for econometrics econom identification. And you probably want to show some evidence that the staggered treatment is random enough, especially after you have control for um, some attributes that could be related to this timing. Um, my third comment is I'm a little surprised to see little changes in the contents of privacy labels. If consumers are responding so negatively and investors are responding so negatively, it seems should provide motivation for apps to reduce their data collection efforts um, in order to um, satisfy consumers and the investors. However, in the data, we don't observe much change in the privacy labels within the same app over time. So um, I can think of a few explanations. One could be, it might be just too costly to change data collection practice because it's embedded in the business model. Um, however, you do show some apps can turn on or turn off the data collection practice. So um, I don't know how costly um, this would be. The second explanation could be that's okay, I'm collecting less data because of this new policies, but the data I collect may turns out to be more valuable. They are the type of consumers that I would like to target, for example. And we actually seen some support for this argument in the aftermath of GDPR in um, Europe. So maybe you want to check out this paper and see whether um, you can have similar evidence um, along that line. Another possibility is, um, as I said before, there are two policies going on, the privacy labels and ATT. Is it possible that consumers and investors actually respond to ATT instead of the release of privacy labels? Um, I think because the two policies are both about privacy and they could be interacting with each other, just time effects may not be enough to control for the impact of ATT. So um, maybe you want to think more uh, identification strategy of how to separate the effect of ATT and the privacy labels. Um, the last reason I can think of is app developers actually use other methods to counter um, the Apple policy. And this is what the industry called pre-pumps. 
So for example, a app um, could have this um, pre-pump try to persuade the users that, okay, we do collect data from you, but that data collection can, can actually help you to um, have a better experience, better personalized experience in our app. So we have seen multiple app developers using this kind of a strategy. Um, so I don't know to what extent this is just anecdote or systematic evidence of why that they don't bother to change the privacy labels. Um, in terms of the investor response, I think some of my questions uh, Juan already covered in her presentation. You probably want to do some robustness check. Um, for example, you use the average average date of disclosure when a publisher um, of apps have multiple apps. Um, you probably want to do some robust checks, say, what if you take the first date of privacy label disclosure from this app developer rather than the average? Would the results change or not? But, but this is not a major point. A more major point is I see that um, some effects on the and cumulative abnormal uh, returns occur about 60 days later after the, the time app developer release, release the privacy label. However, the investors respond immediately to ATT. So these two together make me wonder how much of the effect you find for privacy label actually is driven by ATT, given that ATT is only four months after the first possible release of privacy label. If you take into account the staggered treatment, then it could be on average, the release is about, um, is about two months before the ATT adoption. So um, this is my last slide. I thought a little bit about further directions you could go. I think you already take some action in the first one. Seems like you're saying that there's less switch from more intrusive apps to less intrusive apps. Rather, people seem to be um, just reminded that how invasive the data collection is, and therefore they avoid downloading new apps. Um, I wonder why people think the Apple apps are <laughs> intrusive as compared to Google. Um, wouldn't this remind people thinking, okay, the same app on Google could be as intrusive, and um, or maybe this is just a salient saying that's when you don't see, when you don't see the, the the adverse information in front of you, you just don't remember or don't bother to react to it. Um, my second point is um, you already explored a lot of heterogeneous effect. Um, I'm just adding a few more to that list. For example, does the effect vary depending on how much the revenue of the app depends on advertising rather than in-app purchase or subscription? Because advertising often requires third-party um, data, which could be more intrusive and also more dependent on the data sharing at the back end. Um, and to what extent the competition with Apple-owned apps would affect this effect? And what if the app developer is more dependent on Apple or more dependent on Android, that seems could have a heterogeneous effect in your results. Um, and finally, you have mentioned some of the policy implications. Given the little supply side change, I'm a little hesitant to say that's the market-driven solution work. It seems like it juggled the mind of consumers and investors, but not necessarily changed the behavior of, um, of the app developers. So that just maybe you can um, explore that supply side a little bit more and that can shed more light on the policy implications. But overall, I really enjoy reading the paper. It's, it's a major um, data exercise. It's a lot of efforts, a lot of um, data collection efforts. Yeah, I really appreciate those. Uh, and I learned a lot from the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jinjie. And uh, now we open to the floor. Before that, uh, Juan, do you want to respond quickly in terms of all the discussion and the nice insights from Professor Ginger. Yeah, you. absolutely. I don't think I can respond quickly because uh, Ginger has provided so much food for thought. Um, uh, if I may, maybe I can just quickly respond to each of the three major points. Um, the first 
first uh, first point uh, was about the uh, timing of the first shock privacy label and the second shock ATT. And in our robustness checks, we do exclude some of the late uh, privacy uh, label releasers just to focus on the pure effect of the first uh, policy privacy label. And we do not find the point estimate to differ that much. And also, uh, we think uh, even if uh, some app are uh, acting a strategic way by delaying the release of the privacy labels or maybe even foregoing version update at all, that will uh, imply a downward bias to our estimate because they would just time the release to a day when consumers are inattentive, so on and so forth. And the identification strategy uh, doesn't only rely on the uh, late versus early updaters, but also rely on the Android versus uh, iOS. So uh, our um, uh, estimate are immune from this uh, um, standard staggered diff and diff setting because uh, the identification really comes from within app pair comparison. Uh, but I agree there, there could be still selection or heterogeneous treatment effect depending on the timing of the uh, privacy label release. Um, there is also a question about um, uh, whether um, um, uh, there's why there is very, very little changes on the supply side. To be honest, we were very surprised uh, to see this pattern when we first uh, documented it using the heat map. And we're trying to uh, think more along the lines you suggested. And uh, maybe I think our, our preferred uh, explanation would just be because this has um, tight link with the monetization model. And if you want to change the monetization model, for example, from in-app purchase to in-app advertising or vice versa, that requires maybe more than a year of uh, effort. Um, so the last point uh, uh, is about why Google users do not seem to get, you know, uh, affected by the policy. I think it's mostly behavior. As an iOS user, I never check what information is being displayed in the on the Google uh, Play platform, and I suppose the reverse is going on as well. But thank you so much for uh, for your comments, and please do share the slides with us afterwards. Um, you have given us a nice to do list. Okay, great. Thanks. So who's uh, who's next? Okay, I saw Professor uh, uh, Michael Song is here. So Michael, yes. Oh yes. So so this is uh, this is very stimulating uh, paper. Um, uh, to to someone like me who is completely outside the literature, uh, I was very surprised by uh, by the first set of results. So I'm just I'm probably just repeating uh, what Ginger uh, has said already. And when you you the last uh, response to uh, Ginger's comment is also related to my first uh, to my uh, main question, that is uh, if uh, uh, users are really sensitive to a uh, data privacy issue, then why don't they appreciate you know this policy done by uh, Apple and why you know uh, they actually cut their uh, uh, download and pay less to to Apple and you know, the market share uh, and uh, stock market value also also dropped pretty significantly. So you you, you just uh, mentioned one possibility that, that is uh, it's a very behavioral. Uh, Google users are completely blind about the, what's going on, on the other side. They they are not fully aware. You know they are their apps are also subject to uh, the same issues. Um, but you know, uh, Ginger, uh, I think Ginger mentioned one additional possibility that is, uh, um, app developers are probably just uh, relocating their, um, you know, resources. So they're shifting towards uh, Google. That's uh, that's one possibility. And another possibility is uh, uh, maybe Apple user. I don't know. Apple users might be more sensitive to this issue. So there is a pre-selection, you know, uh, uh, why some users are picking up uh, Apple, why some are picking up uh, Google. So if that's the case, then the estimates probably contain some kind of this pre-selection issue. Um, and I don't know, but once again, I just want to see how you think of these possibilities. Yeah, so, okay, let me address your questions in a reverse manner. You mentioned this pre-selection, which is about what types of users use uh, iPhone and what types of users use the Android phone. Um, so clearly what we're estimating is the average treatment effect on the treated, and we're not claiming if on the Android side, uh, Google released the same information, Android user will also react by uh, reducing their demand by 14%. If we want to push forward that argument, we will need to make additional assumptions. 
Um, so uh, empirically, in order for the definitive identification assumption to hold, we have to validate, you know, just the parallel trend. And I have shown you just uh, one piece of evidence on that, which is the total uh, number of downloads and revenue across these two platforms. We have done uh, much more in the paper. In particular, we have plot the monthly growth rate of the Android version, version against the uh, iOS version. And you can really find that these pairwise growth rate are centered around a 40 five degree line, which suggests uh, prior to this policy, the demand for the Android versus iOS version uh, uh, track each other closely. So uh, we're we're fine with you thinking that Android version, uh, Android users will have different treatment effect. That's fine. We are saying we're estimating the average treatment effect on the iOS users. Uh, so you also mentioned point about how app developers will react to these uh, um, privacy label changes, especially because there's no little time series variations, which may suggest they prioritize Android users in the in the future. But you know, going forward, one year after Android also um, uh, implemented a very similar policy. So. Uh, I don't think in the long run you should really expect to see um, uh, app user or uh, sorry app developers to prioritize one platform platform versus the other because both platforms are actually stepping up the requirement uh, on the app developers. But I, I do think these are very interesting and important uh, industry dynamics, and I, I do want to do follow up project focusing more on the ATT policy and uh, Apple's. Um, De uh, deprecation of the third party cookies, which is just a counterpart of the ATT policy implemented on um, web browsers instead of the uh, app uh, system ecosystem. Uh, I don't know whether that fully addresses uh, your questions. If if uh, it didn't, uh, please do ask your question again. No, no, that has been very clear, especially the treatment effect is uh, just a specific to Apple users. I think that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's very clearly uh, stated. Thank you. Mm. Um, yeah, so relatedly, because I, I, I thought I uh, it's better for me to address another question, which is related to the stock market reaction that just popped up in my mind. And Ginger also made a very good point of um, when we look at stock market reaction, uh, after the privacy policy, label policy, the reaction kicks in um, about um, six days after, then the ATT policy is uh, four months after. Could it be overlapping a little bit? I think uh, regarding that, um, yes, it could be overlapping. So what we can do is, again, to separate the sample based on how early the privacy label release was. And over 50% of the apps in our sample did release their labels uh, prior to January 2023. And uh, if we done if we have done that analysis, we should be able to address the concern. Great. Let me ask one question related to the last point we already did discussion in terms of uh, uh, stock market response. So why not we can I understand your summer period 2020 to 21. Why not as a motivation part? We compare to remember we have a negative shock like a Facebook leakage in terms of a Cambridge Analytical. So during that time, you can see how response in history. And maybe give you some leeway to how to, you know, link with current discussion about this kind of response in terms of investor. It's one point in terms of event study. Second one, I think uh, you show a lot of cross-country heterogeneities. Also remind me how to think about this kind of uh, uh, cross-country uh, variation in terms of privacy. As we know, we have different kind of uh, literacy ability during the digital age, such as uh, income, such as education, such as experience, such as uh, especially people use mobile apps. You talk about this kind of democratic, you know, the aging society compared to young generation, like uh, ASEAN countries, a lot of variation to help you, especially also in terms of investor base. It's the uh, institutional investor base, like US, various uh, retailer, like uh, a like China. So there's a lot of variation to show how response for how co or the individual response in terms of some market, which allows you to another future research, another paper. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the two uh, suggestions rather than questions. So I guess um, they're well taken. I don't need to really uh, provide an answer, right? They're really constructive feedback. Bonnie? Uh, um, uh, yes, I would like to answer a question. Um, <clears throat> just roughly, there is a drop of about 15% down low, roughly 15%. And the stock market, the, the car is roughly about 4.5%. Negative. 
So, so yeah, the four questions in my I have two questions in my number one is who are those people that because of privacy concern are refrain from using the app or pull out? And then if I look at these two numbers, the 15% versus minus 4.5%, it looks like that those that pull out are not uh, are not generate, uh, uh, I mean, they they don't they do not carry the same weight in in their market in the firm's market value. Um, and it, importantly, I really want to know like who pull out and what is the overall welfare implication? Because we do know that data uh, has a public utility, pu pu public a good uh, function. When you have a lot more data, you can serve your customer better, et cetera, et cetera. So I ask, so I ask these questions. Okay, um, so uh, first of all, the stock market reaction for the data invasive apps is, is around 10%. And going from this 15% drop in sales, in raw sales, to the 10% drop in uh, price, I think there are multiple steps. There's, It's very hard to uh, map, uh, have a one-to-one -one mapping because going from sales, you have to deduct cost of goods sold, you have to deduct operating costs. Then, uh, um, you know, it doesn't really imply we should expect a 15% uh, chance in the price or in the cumulative abnormal return. Um, so but at this uh, point, I can only do a bag of envelope calculation. <laughs> Yeah, so it's 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 incredibly hard because different firms have different operating uh, leverage, and uh, we haven't. I agree. If we want to really pitch the paper as a finance paper, we should dig deeper uh, into this uh, linkages between the drop in sales and the drop uh, in the stock prices. Uh, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, so your second question is uh, about who refrain from using privacy invasive apps, and uh, right. where. Uh, collecting additional data on app level user demographics, including gender and age distribution, and we plan to interact these user demographics with the uh, shock as well. So in the literature, I think it's uh, um, the only consensus people have is um, female care more about privacy and uh, uh, older people care more about privacy. Across income and education, there is actually some non-monotonic relationship. Uh, so uh, we don't have a strong prior regarding uh, income and education as well. Great. There was one question in the chat box uh, from Huang Chenji. He said, hi, Huang. I'm curious about platform incentives. Why iOS has such privacy policy when it reduced downloads of apps and earnings? Why Android does not? What's your what's their concern from the you know supply side incentive? Thank you. So that's a very good question. And Ginger also touched upon this point. Um, so I I don't have a, a good answer to this. My view is because Apple's main revenue comes from the sales of Apple. If consumers perceive the Apple ecosystem to be more privacy transparent or privacy protective, they may uh, have a larger demand for iPhones in the future. So you can view this as a competition along the dimension of non-core business, which is just about the app market and the provision of privacy in order to spur the demand for the main business, which is iPhone. But on the other hand, Google can easily follow up and Google did follow Follow up, so it's very hard to predict uh, what is the future trend uh, across these two platforms or um, phone manufacturers. Any other questions? Um, if I can add, um, yeah. I don't know how relevant this is, but definitely there's some speculation in media reports about why Apple adopt um, this privacy-heavy policies. Um, the story goes like Apple wants to get into the digital advertising business yes. and by implementing these policies, the existing giants like Facebook would suffer um, because their data tracking ability is reduced. And in fact, if you look at the stock market of Facebook, I think it dropped at least 8% just upon ATT adoption by Apple. There was a huge concern of um, advertising revenue going away from Facebook towards Apple, um, including Apple's own effort to try to beef up their own department in advertising. Yeah, so since we're on that point, I also would like to invite Ginger to comment on um, Google's deprecation of the third-party cookies, because this one is harder to justify because it thinks it will affect Google's own third-party cookies on other non-Google websites as well. So I was wondering whether it's still also related to these wars between tech giants or not. What's your view on that? 
Um, that's a good point. <laughs> I, I don't have any <laughs> um, any inside information there. Um, I feel like if you look at the history of um, Google Play Store versus Apple iOS Store, they tend to lock with each other very closely in almost every policy. <laughs> so, so I was assuming this just Google's response to Apple's aggressive policy on privacy protection. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for the speakers and uh, presenter and uh, in our discussion. And also, thank you very much for all the wonderful questions. And uh, uh, let me follow what uh, uh, Bernie just asked me to do as the uh, uh, announcement of our next month. So February 8th, 2020, uh, 2023, we're going to have a, a, present, a seminar about uh, bank competition and digital disruption implication for financial inclusion by Glow U from SMU. And discussion will be uh, Northwestern economist, uh, Seal Huck, and the chair will be Palak from Indian Institution of Management. Thank you very much. Happy New Year.